So Heather, for people who maybe don't know you so well, uh, you're Brett Weinstein's wife. I am. You were also at Evergreen. And the main reason I think that you were not as high profile was that you were actually on sabbatical at the time. The protest kicked off and uh, uh, look, the stuff that people have seen. I also have a different personality. It, right. it would have been less like me to, um, to continue going into the hornet's nest. Um, but I was, I was there in the shadows the whole way. You know, I, I read every single thing that he sent out before he sent it out. And, uh, but yes, I was on sabbatical. I was doing a totally different thing, blissfully, for five months in the, in the immediate run-up to, to what happened at Evergreen. And what I find really fascinating is that you have a really strong lived experience of a lot of the... A lot of people talk about this sort of force that they see at work in the media and in various places and that they're very worried about it. But your story seems to me to be the, the Niplas Ultra yeah. example of what can happen when this tendency gets completely out of control. Indeed. I mean, it really, even with the attempts of the Evergreen administration to basically pretend that the story was the opposite of what it was and to hire PR to, to, to make that happen. For a while it seemed to be working and people would say to us, ah, it didn't, it didn't happen the way you said it did. You know, there were never people with baseball bats. You weren't chased out of your own home, you know, all these things. And um, increasingly people are saying, well, yes, Evergreen was bad, but it's sort of a one-off thing. And <clears throat> I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, st I'm horrified and dismayed and heartbroken at what happened, but given that that's what was going on on that campus, I'm glad to know and to have been part of a couple that stood up and not be participating in it through via silence. I'd rather not be there, even as much as I loved the place when it was functional, uh, than to be there under very false and authoritarian uh, pretenses. A lot of people say, as you said, Evergreen was a one-off and this, when, when you talk about this kind of threat you're straw manning, you're kind of creating a bogeyman that doesn't exist. What, what is your impression of that, having gone through the Evergreen experience and then seeing how the culture is at the moment? It's only getting worse. While it is also true that it is not a majority, certainly not a majority of students, not a majority of faculty um, who are pushing this authoritarian ideology, this groupthink, but I would say that a majority of faculty are cowardly and probably so narrowly trained that they have convinced themselves that they don't themselves have the intellectual tools to assess what is going on when these little uprisings erupt as they do on most campuses to some degree. That strikes me as anti-intellectual. The idea that, oh, that's, you know, this, this phrase, stay in your lane, this is the most anti-intellectual authoritarian phrase that, that's emerging right now. Stay in your lane. What, since when do I have a lane? Like, okay, I was, I was trained in a number of different things, as it turns out. Like, I'm, apparently, I'm actually allowed to talk about classical music because I was trained as a classical pianist. But I, don't, I have very little interest in talking about that most days. That's my lane, and anything over in how society is erupting and falling apart is not. Actually, no. Like, absolutely not. And in part, in part, I would say anyone who wants to be a broad thinker should, be, should feel entitled and is entitled to speak and think in particular on any topic they want. But, um, and you know, this is my distinct bias, but I think it is warranted. Evolutionary tools, evolutionary thinking, allow you access to thinking about just about anything with the exception of things like rocks and quarks, right? Rocks and quarks don't you know, are not subject to the rules of evolution. But otherwise, everything else, and pretty much everything that you've got ar us ar around here uh, was created by humans or modified by humans for our purposes. And we ourselves are evolved. And we are, you know, we are these very strange generalists and specialists who are also you know, apes and monkeys and primates and mammals and you know, and reptiles and vertebrates and all of these things, and there's truth in each one of those layers. And the fact that we're animals tells us for sure that we have 
um, that we are sexually reproducing, and you know, not all animals are, but at, at their base, animals are sexually reproducing. We're sexual creatures. That's what we are. And when sex shows up in animals, as it does across almost all of them, there's two of them. And so, you know, being able to talk from a scientific perspective and then go, you know, at one level narrower and narrower, except once you get to humans, then it explodes into this big thing again. There is this, there is a long history actually of the social sciences looking over at biology and going basically stay in your lane. You can talk about chimps if you want to and bonobos and gorillas, but that's it. As soon as you get to humans, you're not allowed. And there are a lot of us over in evolution space who are saying, nope, nope, no way, because only with the tools of evolution are you going to be able to more fully understand what it is that we are and why we're, why we're behaving the way we are. And would you say that sex and gender is at the core of that conversation? I don't know that it's at the core, but it's one of, it's one of the focal points, for sure. I think one of the major confusions, at least that I run into, and maybe, that, maybe this is just... Uh, more about the particular conversations that I'm pulled into, both because of my interests and because of what I've been speaking on. Um, but the confusion about sex and gender is particularly widespread. It is partic particularly easy to politicize. And almost, it, there are so many different confusions possible and so many different ways that people are willing to be angry about what is true and what they want to claim is not true, um, that it's, it's just, it's ripe to be one of the epicenters of disagreement and sort of one of the, one of the hills on which the battle for enlightenment values is being fought. From the experience at Evergreen, do you feel that certain doors have opened at the same time as other doors have closed? Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, I'm, we're sitting here, right? And, um, and I've been sitting in a lot of rooms with a lot of people that I never would have met before. And uh, that's extraordinary. And it's certainly nothing that the administration at Evergreen imagined would happen <laughs> or wanted to happen when they went rogue. Um, for that, I'm grateful. And Brett's and my world has expanded dramatically. We have much less stability and financial security but we have much more possibility to do good in the world. We were doing good with 25 or 50 students at a time for 15 years, 16 years, and that was amazing. And through it, we learned tools about engagement and um, actual teaching and actually reaching people that I don't think we could have learned anywhere else. But in terms of reach, the reach never grew. Right, the reach continued to expand by that same incremental amount every year. And uh, I, you know, many of those students are still my friends. I'm in touch with even more of them. And they are, they are wonderful. And I cherish them and that time. But given that Evergreen was going off the rails in the way that it was, and it refused to be helped, like it really actively refused to be helped. We offered as many ways as we could think of. Uh, I, it would be foolish of me to be anything but grateful for many aspects of this new life. And one of the doors that has opened is the intellectual dark web, which... Has a door. That's a new metaphor. Yeah. What, you're, you're in the intellectual dark web, according to the New York Times? I, I guess. Well, and it is the arbiter of truth. Yeah. Um, so what do you see the IDW as... What, what's your frame for the IDW? I don't... I haven't formalized a frame for it. Uh, it feels like a, an, a true recognition of an aggregation of individuals and ways of approaching intellectual disagreement and conversation. That at the time that Barry Weiss wrote that article in May of 2018, um, many of us knew each other, many of us didn't. Um, in terms of just the people that she names in that article, um, you know, to varying degrees. And I still haven't met some of them. We, if you take those people as some, uh, they're just a named subset, um, politically very diverse, uh, developmentally from a lot of different backgrounds, 
how it is that they're making their mark in the world is pretty diverse, although maybe somewhat less so. There are a lot of podcasters um, among them uh, and people interviewing and you know, really having conversations um, as a way of making their way in the world, which is maybe one of the unifying things about, um, about what the IDW is to the degree that it is a thing. People who, who engage ideas broadly and who are willing to sit down with ideas even when they don't feel that they have the background, have the training, have the authority. It is, it is very much of the moment, I think, uh, and I hope that it remains of the moment. The, the clear hunger that there is for people to be simultaneously pointed in their critique with evidence to back up what they say or a hypothesis test with which you might assess whether or not what I'm saying is true, always with respect and compassion and a refusal to conflate the individual with the argument, I think is perhaps the right encapsulation of what, what the group is. Um, therefore, people in the group and you know, many, 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 many others besides um, tend to reject orthodoxy, tend to reject ideology, tend to be interested in first principles thinking, meaning that uh, if you, you, you don't take something on faith, you try to figure out if that's true, what else must be true? Let me see how far back I can go in the logic tree and see what basic assumption sits at the floor of that, such that if I have to start questioning this thing here, I've already done this backwards logic <clears throat> and I can, as, as this starts to falter, I can go back. Is this faltering too? Is this faltering? And maybe it's the assumption. Maybe it's the basic fundamental assumption of whatever it is that you believe. And you know, not, all, not all beliefs are subject to that. There are, some, there are some that you just can't do that with, some issues that really are questions of, but I simply, I simply do believe that it is immoral, say, to kill an unborn child. I don't, but you know, that, that will be a belief that some people hold, and there's like, what would the assumption be at the base of that? I don't, I don't find one, right? Um, but uh, addressing questions of what life is, and what the barriers around life are, like all of those questions can be assessed scientifically. And being willing to go in and being willing, not, you don't have to be excited, but being willing to be wrong, being willing to be publicly wrong even, and to have to, or to be very wrong in the moment and not know it, and come back and say, screwed up, looked into it, or someone else revealed to me, this is a thing that I thought because of these things, and turns out, no. So that, that is tough for most people to do for psychological reasons, but it's also something that we have almost no experience seeing, because politics doesn't allow politicians to ever do that. Which we've called before on our channel, Thinking in Public. Yes. That it's almost an yeah. example of people thinking in public. Right. And people are very hungry for that as a, as that, a phenomenon. That's, that's exactly right. And politicians have been for some reason, I don't have an answer for, for this, although it's probably pretty simple. Why aren't politicians allowed to think in public? They are, when they do, they will of course make errors and they are just slaughtered, right? They are disappeared. So it is no accident that the people, at least who Barry Weiss described in that IDW article and in general the sort of you know, larger amorphous group who identifies as such, are mostly people who are not beholden to institutions. There is, this would be harder for me to do, for Brett to do, if we were still at Evergreen. If we were still at the Evergreen of 10 years ago, which had complete academic freedom, it would have been possible. But today's Evergreen? Not so much. It's harder to do with any kind of employer who might be monitoring what it is that you do in the world, your public persona, and be concerned that uh, others will conflate what you say with what they think. I guess one of the reflex criticisms of the IDW that you probably expected was it's, it's white men protecting themselves, which is a kind of reflex criticism that you often have from the left. There aren't so many women in 
the IDW, you're, you're one of them. Do, what, what do you make of that? Well, so you said white and men, and I think uh, the answer is potentially different for those two criticisms. Um, you know, there's, there's no bigotry in any of these people whom I know in varying degrees. There's none. It's just, that's, that's one of the things that does unify us, as it does so many people, actually, right? If, if you are worldly and you have spent time with enough different people, um, whatever bigotry you did have fades. So um, the lack, the, there's, no, there's not a lack, but um, the somewhat lower racial diversity than, uh, than you would expect if it was just picked at random from the Earth's population, um, I think does reflect um, past inequalities in opportunity for, for some races. And um, that, so here's an anecdote. Um, when I was a TA, when I was in graduate, student, uh, in graduate school at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, I taught a lot of intro bio classes that were basically hoops for pre-meds. <clears throat> And sometimes I got pre-vet, sometimes I got pre-nursing. Very occasionally I got students who said they wanted to be scientists. Very rarely. And you know, I, I loved them. <laughs> um, they were more curious on average. And it was a not very racially diverse student body, U of M, in the 90s. Um, but it was somewhat diverse. And I remember talking, not at my instigation, to a few of my black students one year. Um, about why they were pre-med um, and not pre-science, not that that's a term. Uh, and they said, look, I hope, I hope this changes soon, but at this point, my family, I'm the first in my family to go to college, and they are taking financial risks to allow me to be here, and I cannot take the kinds of risks that being a scientist entail. Being a doctor at that point, not so much anymore given what's happened to the American healthcare system, but being a doctor was uh, a pretty good guarantee of a very good income. And what these, it turns out these were um, all men, um, what these, these few young black men, anecdote, but um, said to me, and I then asked a few other students over the years and I got the same kinds of answers back, was, um, we don't have the kind of resource to, to fall back on for me to follow what might or might not be my passion. I haven't even really thought about it. I'm going to be a doctor. So um, that may be part of what is, is going on with regard to, to race. With regard to sex, um, you know, there's no, sex isn't a lineage like race to some degree is. Uh, unlike an African-American family uh, that uh, is sending their first child to college, there is no family of all women who are sending their first woman to college. That's not how it works, obviously. So, um, you know, on down through the ages. Uh, so we, it's not possible that that's the explanation with regard to um, imagined discrepancies in the expected sex ratio in the IDW. This is how I would say it as the biologist. Um, Any time these claims of a gender gap come up, I, my brain goes to, why do you expect the sex ratio in the particular population they're looking at to be one-to-one? -one? Just because the population is one-to-one -one does not mean that this self-selected group is going to be one-to-one. -one. Because guess what? On average, men and women are different. We have different aptitudes even, but let's just put that aside. Like there, there is evidence in some regards and uh, you know, with regard to general intelligence, not so much, but you know, there's, there's a lot of varied stuff over in terms of what particular aptitudes men and women have that are different. You know, women tend to be more about language and text and men tend to be more about math and spatial reasoning. That research, put it aside for the moment, let's just talk about preferences, which frankly probably emerge from underlying aptitudes, but just preferences. In the most gender equal countries out there, in the Scandinavian countries, you see people going more and more to more gender traditional roles. 
they are doing everything they can to try to get rid of gender traditional expectations and people are freed from expectations pursuing them even more. So, you know, famously James Damore and the Google memo claimed not that women can't code, for God's sake, he never said that. He said, and he cited literature that has stood a not very long test of time, but stood the test of time, that um, actually women seem to prefer this kind of work less than men do. And, um, and that just, that seems to be the case. So I think that women on average probably prefer risky conversation less than men do. And that sounds, that sounds like it's going to be a problem. But, you know, and if it's true, it may be a little bit ugly, but sometimes truth is ugly. I would say that two things that we know from the psychological literature, which could be overturned, but these things have stood the test of time, are that, um, let's see, on the big five personality test, the personality trait that is agreeableness is very gendered. Women are, on average, much more agreeable than men are. And all of the subcategories under agreeableness, none of which I remember at the moment, women are more agreeable. That would tend to make women, on average, less interested in getting involved in conversations where they were, uh, they should expect to be challenged and were expected to give challenge. It's not a particularly agreeable position. It's uncomfortable, right? Uh, I would say also that um, the Ash experiment from the late 50s, early 60s in Princeton, one of the uh, mid-century psych experiments that, um, that were famous and stood the test of time, the conformity experiments, in which um, at, that, at the point that he did it, it was all Princeton male undergrads uh, who were asked, without going into the details of the experiment, um, to describe how long a line was compared to other lines when there were th seven, I think, confederates who answered before them wrongly. And 75%, I think, of the subjects in the original experiment conformed to a patently, factually wrong answer some of the time. Not very many people conformed all the time, but 75%, I think that's the number, conformed some of the time, which is a really large number. So. The ASH experiment has been redone many times in many different settings, including now, of course, with women, because this was this is, you know, one of the very real things that we are emerging from not too long ago, where women were not included in a lot of uh, medical and psychological experiments, to the detriment of women's health, frankly. Um, when these experiments have been redone, including women, the result is uncomfortable, but it's been repeated, and it's that women conform at an even higher rate than men. Women conform to social pressure to agree to wrong things at a higher rate than men do. I think that agreeableness and over in the big five personality index, whatever it's called, and conformity as measured by the ASH experiment are highly coupled concepts. And I don't know, I don't know if there's a psychological literature uh, comparing them, but they strike me as very similar and uh, perhaps because of women's greater tendency to conform to social norms, and perhaps because of women's tendencies to be somewhat more agreeable than men, the kinds of engagement that uh, occur by the people whom Barry Wise profiled and a, large, a very much larger number of people who are seeking truth even when it hurts, may be, at least at first, more the purview of men than women. Not that everyone isn't invited and encouraged, but the preferences underlying where you go are different. And what are those areas that are now really hot topics? Well, sex, that one's still on, that one's off, yeah. Um, there are a lot. The, the ones that are getting the most play at the moment are sort of the, the demographic ones that the authoritarian left is yelling about a lot. And yes, 
there are some dog whistles to the authoritarian right, but that's a smaller group and pretty much, pretty much society-wide, we don't approve of what goes on on the authoritarian right. And that leaves the vast majority of conservatives going like, we disavow those guys. <laughs> but, but we're here, the 98% of us are here. And then on the left, the authoritarian left, the ones who are actually yelling is a tiny percentage. But the things that they are saying that are threatening to become the new orthodoxy and that now increasingly large numbers of the left, even those who don't, who if they just thought about it a little bit, they would realize they don't agree with these things, are questions of um, sex and gender, what sex is, um, questions about religion and religious tolerance and whether or not we should be allowed and able and actually should be should be asking all of the same questions of every religion if we you know especially on the left people sort of pride themselves on being secular and it's become it's become very fashionable to hate on christianity and to love on islam and why are we not applying the same kinds of critiques to any religion that's out there uh, of course, uh, are there differences between races is a dangerous, dangerous topic. Uh, but to the extent that races represent real populations that have had separate histories of breeding, of course there are differences. Will one be able to be seen as better than another? Better, what is better? Better in what context? Better how? Better for what thing? My feeling is, as an evolutionary biologist, of course not, not better for modernity, um, but different. If there's actually, like, if there, are, if there are racial, if there are real races, which is increasingly not the case anymore, uh, then of course there will be differences, just like there are differences on average between men and women, which don't, re don't reflect a lineage the same way races do. Um, you know, the, the, actual, the actual stuff we should be talking about, like the actual existential threat stuff, like AI and energy and climate change and you know, nuclear, nuclear everything, war and energy together, uh, somehow barely ranks on the list of what's being yelled at over here, which makes it seem really non-organic at some level. Because wh where are all the actual important conversations? Like, why aren't we talking about the things that actually matter? And if we can get through, well, I don't know if it's the next 40 years. I hope it's not the next four. But, you know, four years, 40 years, 100 years. If, if humanity's still here in 100 years, we are going to have fixed most of these problems or we're not going to be here. I mean, it feels like we're at, we're at this point on so many of these issues, almost none of them being the ones that we're talking about all the time. But it's those, it's those of sort of enforced tolerance of crazy views on sex and gender and religion and race and, I, there, there must be others, but you know, all of, you know, everything in the progressive stack, right? That, um, you know, we, we have to pretend that body weight has no effect on health. Do we really? You're like, that's where we are? That's one of the big issues? Um, no, we don't, and we're gonna move on. Oh, we're not gonna move on, you have held us hostage. So, two things, right? There's a bunch of conversations we should be having, and some people are still, um, but mostly we're stuck over here talking about, actually, no, we're gonna stand for science and say, there's differences. There are differences between men and women. Trans is real, rare, and a lot of people currently claiming to be trans aren't that thing. And trans man and man aren't the same thing. Not the same thing. Because a lot of these topics have become toxic on the left, the only place, because we can say, well, no one's talking about this, no one's talking about this, and then you, you can look at the fact that these are being widely talked about on the right, they're being widely talked about online, so it's not true that no one's talking about them, but the fact that they're not being talked about in the left, in the media, in these kinds of institutions is a big problem because suddenly the only people who are talking about them are possibly people who don't have 
um, who, who may have some bigotry there. There may the conversation may go toxic. So I guess it, it's good to kind of define that sometimes. Yeah. So you know the right. You know there are amazing numbers of good and honorable and smart people on the right, and I knew that. I mean, I, I, I had friends on the right before this, but I have a lot more now, and I've heard from a lot more. And the fact is that we both, the left should want a smart and educated right, and the right should want a smart and educated left, and, uh, and certainly the right hasn't had that for, for a while. Um, that said, there are different ways to define what makes you a liberal versus a conservative or left or right. Uh, but one of the fundamental ways that I think is pretty standard to define the differences is are you fundamentally interested in regulation uh, for either uh, systems that are too big for individuals to regulate or to help people who have gotten the raw end of the stick? If you are, if you are, if you are pro-regulation at some level, then you're over in left space. And so um, even imagining that we've excluded that tiny percentage of the right that are actually uh, bigots and nasty and don't have the best interests of all of humanity at heart and you take the remaining whatever it is 90 plus percent for sure um, the fact is we do disagree about real things right the left and the right disagree about um, the well first the level of actual um, inequality remaining in the world, which is part of what the far left is screaming about. Um, but more to the point for right now, left and right disagree on what we should do about it. And in general, what the right has seen uh, is, boy, do, does the left not recognize unintended consequences of regulations. And because we can't know, we better just not. Let's just, let's just let these systems go and the market will take care of it. And people on the left are much more likely to say, yes, absolutely, and precautionary principle, please. But we're going to have to regulate some things that individual, individuals and unregulated markets simply can't, simply can't fix. So yeah, we, need, we need all the reasonable people on both sides to try to shut down the bigots on their, on their extremes. The right has its bigots, the left has its bigots, and the left pretends that they're anti-bigots, but it's, they're bigots all the same. And start having the conversations that they